Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. The new book, written by Sandra A. McManus, is filled with comfort, hope, and joy. It's titled Boldly Encouraged. A Personal Journey of Faith and Hope. And we're going to talk all about this book right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. The author, Sandra, is sitting here with me. Sandra, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's great to talk to you today. It's great to be talking with you. And I'm really excited to learn about Boldly Encouraged. Sandra, can you tell me about it? Yes. Well, this book is about just loving and heartfelt encouragement. I think we all need that in this day and age. And it actually didn't start out as a book, believe it or not, but it started out as a simple challenge from church to create a Facebook group of 10 people and just regularly pray for them. So I did that. I made my group of 10, but I really had it in my heart to do more for the group. So I started writing posts. The posts were inspired by examples of what was happening in my own life as a nurse, a wife, and a homeschool mom. But what transpired was really incredible because I go out walking every day and I'd pray for the group. And then I started to get ideas for what I could write to them to encourage them. And oftentimes it was the exact thing that they needed to hear. So I'd come home, write notes, and then I actually did all the writing on my phone and post it because I didn't even have my own computer at that time. I posted in the group for a couple of years. Then the post sat dormant in Facebook until my husband told me to start retrieving them. By this time, I had a computer of my own, so I pulled the posts off, I edited them, and I wrote more. And Corey, at this point, I really started to enjoy the writing process. I really felt it kind of clicked, and I got it, and I enjoyed it a lot. So my husband compiled everything I wrote, and he came home with a huge stack of papers one day, and he said, Sandra, what we have here is a book. And so my husband submitted the pages to three publishers. It was picked up by two of them. And some of the chapters include, they're, they're short, it's a devotional, so they're just two pages each. So one is, do all to the glory of God. Another is, we all need a coach. And then another is, how to survive a rough day. So that's how it became a book. Hmm. When it comes to writing and publishing and all of that, Sandra, is this your first time or do you have experience in this kind of thing? It's absolutely my first book because I spent my career as a nurse and I had no intention of really writing anything. The kind of things we write as nurses are like care plans for patients. So they're not books. <laughs> <laughs> and once this was all compiled and then you sent it in for publishing, was that a long process? No, it only took about nine months because it is a very short book and the process was fairly simple. What about the publishing process would you say was the most challenging for you? Well, it was certainly different sitting at a computer kind of with a split screen and looking at a lot of numbers, reading the book over and over and over. I think I read my own book over at least four or five times, you know, every word. So it was a very detailed process, but enjoyable. Hmm, Great. And you got to tell me about what was going through your head and what you were feeling whenever you open up the mailbox and finally there it is, your first copy of Boldly Encouraged. What was that like for you, Sandra? Well, I remember coming home and I got a notification a package had been delivered and I was pretty sure I knew what it was. So I picked it up and came home and opened it up. And I was so pleased with the cover art on the book. The publishing company did such a great job. And then seeing my name in print was pretty amazing. So I'm very thankful that it all came together. So now you're officially a published author, Sandra. To you, what's the most rewarding aspect of that? Well, I think it's to be able to have an audience for people to read your work and to be able to leave a legacy. Like in my case, my audience is anybody who's stressed or overworked or anxious because I address all these issues in the book. And I also really keyed into the fact that everyone was stressed because we went through a pandemic together. I mean, we all all throughout the world went through this pandemic and we all have rough days. You know, we get stuck in traffic. We're challenged by parenting. But the book will take you to a place of peace and hope and love and joy. 
Again, this is titled, Boldly Encouraged, A Personal Journey of Faith and Hope. It's written by Sandra A. McManus and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. So you can pick it up everywhere, like at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Sandra, how nice it's been talking with you here tonight and learning all about Boldly Encouraged. Thanks again for talking. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. It was a pleasure. Time is on your side. It's author Stephen B. Watson's new book, and it tells the story of a group of people whose future is uncertain. We're going to talk all about this here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Stephen, the author, is with me now. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Corey. It's my pleasure, Stephen. I'm curious to learn all about Time is on Your Side. Can you tell me about it? Wow, where do I start? The book is really a slice of American life here in 2024. It involves relationships, some loving, some difficult. It involves issues like domestic violence, mental health crises, a suicide attempt, murder. So there are many different facets of it. One thing that I am proud of is that I was able to develop my characters in a colorful way. I gave them life in a way in which the book will make the reader cry at times. It will make the reader laugh at times, cause the reader to ask him or herself some important questions, which is my hope, or to agree with me on some of the observations that I have made. Stephen, what kinds of readers do you think you were writing for here? Intelligent readers, intellectuals are the people who will really grasp my writing content because I strive to communicate in the language that brings out people's ability to think critically through critical examination, that kind of thing, sir. Hmm. How did this book come about, Stephen? How did you get the idea for it? Oh, wow. It didn't start really at one specific time. It was born really through years ago. I had an idea that my book, my first book, I wanted to concentrate on a female history teacher who was African-American but had a European look to her. So therefore, people commonly mistook her to be European. That was the groundwork that I wanted to use. And from that point on, I realized that she must have a family. And I thought about things from her perspective, things like dating, things like her views as a history teacher, her relationships with her father, who was also a prominent character. I wanted to start go from uh, my main character, who is Allison, the history teacher, Allison Adams, and expand into her family and into her friends and to her coworkers, former students. Yeah, I thought that that was the most feasible way of doing that, sir. Well, once you got started writing this, Stephen, how long of a journey was this for you, clear up until it got published? It didn't take me long. It took me about a year to write it. And when it came to the publishing process, what did you find the most challenging part about that part, Stephen? Editing can be a challenge, but I found that just by having a positive attitude about it and thinking about the big picture was the best way to go about that, sir. Stephen, is this your first time writing and publishing, or have you done this kind of thing before? I've been a writer all of my life, sir, so I like to think that I've been building up to this for quite some time, sir. Hmm. Now, you got to tell me about that moment, what you were feeling, what you were thinking whenever you got that first copy in and you finally got to hold Time is on Your Side for the first time. What was that like? A sense of achievement. I guess like a soldier who completes his mission, possibly, or an athlete who wins MVP of his team, of his football team. Yeah, proud. And you're a published author, Stephen. What's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? I hope, you know, at this point, it's early to say the most rewarding aspect. But my hope is that the most rewarding aspect will be that I will receive critical acclaim. person was just asking me just yesterday, for example, how much money my book had made. And I told him that's really the least of my concerns. or That's not something that's at the forefront of my thoughts when I'm writing, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm. Getting back to your first question and who is my audience, I find that we Christians know how to relate to each other. I find that through word of mouth, time is on your side, will build up quite a readership. I know a lot of readers are going to be blessed by this book, and I encourage everyone listening to check it out for sure. Again, this is titled, Time is on Your Side. It's written by Stephen B. Watson, 
published by Covenant Books, so you can find it everywhere like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Stephen, got to thank you again for coming on the show. Really love talking with you. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Author Vestine Nkungu's new book is a true story of survival. It's titled, The Only Child Left, The True Story of a Young Girl Who Survived the Rwanda Genocide. And I get to find out all about this book. The author, Vestine, is here with me now. Vestine, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for welcoming me. Now, the pleasure's all mine. Vestine, can you tell me all about The Only Child Left? What will readers find here? Yeah, thank you. The Only Child Left book is about my journey as an 11-year-old survivor of the 1994 Rwanda genocide against the Tutsi people. That took more than one million lives. I found myself like a branch cut from a tree and left alone after losing my entire family in that short span of time. The book also talks about my life after this tragedy and how I end up in the new land of the United States of America. Vestine, what inspired you to write your story and publish it for the world? That's a good question. So, between 2014 and 2015, I met with a pastor, Carson, who prophesied to me what, that I will write many books and they will help many people and heal many souls. Then on my circumstances, when I met with this pastor, writing a book was a faraway dream to me. But when it comes time for God to fulfill his will, you can do it without anyone's help. In January 2017, I took leadership training that required me to set a goal. My first goal was to get a new job, which happened the following March. After getting the new job, I wanted to go continue my studies, but this didn't work out. So my next goal was to write a book. My new job paid for a tourer whose name is Sarah, who helped me to improve my English. Sarah had experience in writing. My boss and I shared with Sarah that I planned to write a book because the idea of continuing school had failed. So Sarah and I started writing on a book, but she became busy and didn't have time to finish it. In 2022, I asked my friend Mary, who is a teacher, if she could help me finish the book. She agreed. But this time, I had a burning desire and did not want to wait any longer. Because seeing innocent children losing their life or becoming orphaned, the growing of hatred and division all around the world, it pushed me to move out of my comfort zone and speak up. Because my country, Rwanda, was a torn part because leaders chose to lead by emotion, pieces of justice. My first message is to inspire people to overcome hardships. And my second is to warn people of the destruction that comes from hatred when it is allowed to spread. Vestine, who were your target readers that you had in mind for this? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> my book has a large target audience, but mainly my target is the youth because they are the future generation. I do suggest parental guidance for anyone under the age of 15. Though this book offers a message of hope, it also contains graphic details that may not be suitable for younger audiences. Other groups that may benefit from this book are government leaders, religious leaders, and adults. Being the only child left, I have witnessed firsthand that horrible consequences that result from acts of hatred. So I have a simple message for each group. For readers, this book serves as a motivation to be a part of the solution by uniting the people they serve and not dividing them. For adults, this book serves as an encouragement to invest in young generations and help prepare them for a successful future. And for young people, this book serves as a lesson to be aware of the doors they open and influence they follow. Because my story is an example of how easy it is for hatred to spread. Again, the title is The Only Child Left, The True Story of a Young Girl Who Survived the Rwanda Genocide. This is written by Vestine Nkungu and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
So you can get it everywhere, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or also down the street at your local bookshop. Vestine, it's been really wonderful finding out about your story and about this book. Thank you so much for joining me again tonight. Yeah, thank you for watching, me. Author R.W. Vince Arnold has written a scholarly and practical resource for enhancing resilience and well-being. The book is titled Transforming Mindfulness, I Rest in Him, The Ancient Wisdom, Modern Science, and Philosophical Roots of Mindfulness-Oriented Meditation. And we're going to talk all about this book. Vince, the author, is here with me now. Vince, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for the invitation. The pleasure is all mine, Vince. Can you tell me all about Transforming Mindfulness and what you've written here? Well, Transforming Mindfulness is a book that's really grown out of a lifetime interest of mine in, I'd say, three streams of thought, psychology, theology, and spirituality. I had the privilege of serving as a Navy chaplain for 28 years and then 11 years as a clinic director and counselor, first at a PTSD treatment center at Camp Lejeune as a director, and then secondly at the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic as a pastoral counselor. And in that work with PTSD patients and traumatic brain injury patients, I was able to primarily focus on developing the specialty in the area of called mindfulness. And it was out of that work during those 11 years that patients constantly would say to me, Dr. Arnold, you ought to write a book about this stuff. Of course, I didn't have much time at that point, but after I retired several years ago and COVID hit, I decided to sit down and write that book, the kind of book that I would like to read. Would you say this is a book primarily for those who are serving in the armed forces or veterans, or Vince, is this for maybe a broader audience? It's a broader audience. I would like the whole world to be able to read something that's I call a compendium of knowledge on this subject. And so I address who the book is written for actually in a section at the front of the book. Rather grandiose, I admit. But the truth is, as long as you're not afraid to use a dictionary, anybody can read the book. And I say that a little tongue-in-cheek because the first book I was ever introduced to in college when I signed up, registered, wrote my check for my first semester, the registrar handed me a Webster's Dictionary. And I learned to use it. And to be honest, writing in the field of psychology, theology, and spirituality, there's a lot of technical language. So I just made a decision not to avoid the big words, but to actually try to translate those into a vernacular that most people could understand. I include a vocabulary. And so to be honest and answer your question, it does seem to best appeal to what I would call the emerging adults, which are college age, 18 to in their 30s. But the audience could go beyond that from counselors, practitioners of mindfulness, teachers of yoga, people that are interested in spirituality and enhancing that. And in particular, I come from a Judeo-Christian perspective because in the field, there's a lot said and done about mindfulness and its roots. And people from the other traditions, like the Judeo-Christian tradition, that aren't interested or familiar with Buddhism or Hinduism or other traditions, per se, that had written a lot on mindfulness, I wanted to transform that mindfulness into the context that that particular population could begin to understand. And then the teachers that are teaching yoga and meditation and know their students could help them overcome some of those cultural barriers that strange language and different worldviews or religious traditions seem to represent for some people. Do you have any advice now that you could throw out there for aspiring authors? I would just encourage them to do a little internet research. It's easy to find the different areas that, that are involved in the printing. So just you know, use some common phrases like self-publishing or traditional publishing and editing services and on and on. It's all online. It's really a wonderful time with the internet access that pretty much everybody has access to. Don't underestimate your ability to actually publish a book. I think readers are really going to love this. I encourage everyone to check it out. Again, this is titled Transforming Mindfulness. I Rest in Him, The Ancient Wisdom, Modern Science, and Philosophical Roots of Mindfulness-Oriented Meditation. Again, this is written by R.W. Vince Arnold, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing, 
So you can find it everywhere that you normally go for books, like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Vince, thank you again for joining me and telling me about your work. I had a really nice time chatting tonight. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope people will find this a helpful resource. Joining me right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Carla Kern. Carla, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. This is very exciting. It is exciting. It's exciting you have a new book out called ABCs for You and Me. So, Carla, can you tell me all about that? Well, it is a book for probably one-and-a-half-year-olds to six-year-olds. And I have five children and nine grandchildren, and I've read a lot of books to a lot of kids. And I came up with this idea for an interactive ABC book that is interesting to children and adults, so nobody will be bored reading it. Each page, I've drawn pictures for each letter. Like on the A page, I have an aquarium, but on the top of the aquarium, I have a Noah's Ark. And so all my drawings are hand-drawn. There's no computer. Everything is hand-painted. All the ideas came out of my quirky brain. And the children can count things in the pictures. They can identify colors. I have a little bit of, like, from highlight magazines where you could find hidden things that always appeal to kids, especially boys, I think. And my goal is just to have a really nice experience for the reader and the readee to learn their ABCs and just enjoy some different drawings. They're all completely different. For instance, on the O page, the origami page, I call it, I did all these animals and I did them as origami animals. Oh, I love it. And then I painted the whole entire background orange. So kind of different thoughts, not just your basic ABC. Carla, you are absolutely right that adults are going to like this as much as children because I'm looking at the cover right now and there is so much going on. I'm just looking at each letter and the illustrations, what's going on in there. It's so much fun. There is a key to the front cover in the back of the book. There's a lot more to be seen than what you're looking at. If you're looking at the G, it's a gray gazing goose with green grass and a goldfish. <laughs> I love it. So you need to check out the key to find all the funny, silly things. How long did a book like this take you to write and illustrate and put through the publishing process? It took about five years off and on. I drew the letters a long time ago, and I started making names for people like a new baby or a shower gift or something. And so say your name is Jane. I have several different J's and A's and N's, and I would hand draw all of these and sell them to people. And I enjoyed that. And I thought, you know, it's time to do a poster. So then I did a great big poster with the ABCs that doesn't have ABCs for you and me in it. It's just a poster of the ABCs. And then I had several people say, why don't you do a book? And so I wrote down all the ideas. And when the idea struck for each letter, I did not do them in order. I just would wake up and like, oh, I have all these ideas for W. And I would sit down and draw it and gain it. And then it would maybe be a month or two till I did another one. But the more that I had done, I could see the end. I was going to be able to do all of the pages. So I picked up the pace. And then I could only imagine that day whenever you got the first copy of this in. And, you know, there's nothing like seeing that finished product after all that time and work. What was that like for you, Carla? You know, it was so exciting because, like you say, it's anticipation upon anticipation. And the Christian Faith Publishers did such a good professional job with my book. It took several conversations and a few tears on my part, but we got it exactly the way I wanted it. And I'm very proud of it. Do you think you would do this all over again, Carla? Write another book? You know, I don't think so. I'm 74, and my hand's not as steady, and I've got other things to do. I'm very involved in my church and grandkids and kids. So I think this is my one and only. The title is ABCs for You and Me. It's written by Carla Kern and published by Christian Faith Publishing. So 
Go everywhere where you'd normally go to pick up your books, like Amazon or Barnes & Noble and iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to pick this up. Well, Carla, it's been really wonderful talking with you tonight and learning about the ABCs for you and me and your art and everything. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much. I'm looking at a new book here now that's an empowering resource for personal healing and growth. It's written by Mark E. Foltz, and it's titled, Coin of Brokenness, Which Side of Brokenness Are You? And I'm going to talk all about this book. The author, Mark, is here with me at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Mark, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. It's a delight for me to be with you. I'm really excited to find out about your book, Coin of Brokenness, Mark. Can you tell me all about what readers can expect here? There's no story like your own story. And so The Coin of Brokenness includes some of those personal illustrations of my own life, my own circumstances, but yet also it recognizes elements that I have seen as I have ministered in the lives of other people. I really think everybody encounters brokenness in their life but not everybody responds the same to those. And so the writing of the book stem from some of my own experiences, things that I have observed and learned in my ministry and counseling, et cetera. Really, no one is exempt from brokenness at all in their life. But what I wanted to do and I've tried to do is to give somebody a resource that brokenness isn't a final chapter, but it's a stepping stone to something else. Mark, would you say that this is a book primarily for believers, or do you think this would have broader appeal? I think it can reach many different people. You know, it is some for believers, no doubt, but even for unbelievers as well. So what sparked the idea to write this book, Mark? I would probably say through an unfortunate set of circumstances that happened in my life, I began to look at it, and it was a process and a journey that I did not expect to take, but it also revealed so much more, some things that I had learned that were not a positive side. And in that process and things that I became involved in since, in working with people and education, et cetera, it has allowed me to see how important this subject is and people to recognize it. When it comes to writing books and being published and everything like that, how much experience do you have? Have you done this before? Not really. I do have another devotional series book that I just began that came out a little bit before, Coin of Brokenness. But this particular book is a first for me in working with a publisher. Oh, congratulations on getting that first one published, Mark. How long of a journey was this for you, Mark, from beginning to end? Probably a good year and a half couple years, probably, in working with this particular book. So after all that time, after all the work that you put into this, what was that day like whenever you finally got it in the mail and you got to hold the physical copy of it? Well, I was a little bit emotional. It was like a surreal moment. I, it was like, is it real? Is, it, is this a reality? You know, there was so much in the process as I learned, you know, through it all. And then to be able to, uh, you know, sit there in my home with, with some of my family around me. And yeah, it was very special. It was very special to be able to see that this is real. It's done. Here it is. The publishing end of things can be very eye-opening for a lot of people who are doing that for the first time. Mark, what did you find the most challenging part for you of that end? Just the, probably the, the whole editing process. It was like you, you edit it, and then you they correct it, and then it's more editing, and you find more stuff, and the more you read, it was like, ah, oh, is there ever an end to all of this? <laughs> but, you know, it's all, it's all good, because you definitely don't want anything out there that is, you know, not done well. So that was probably the biggest challenging, the process of it all, and just get, getting through the whole editing process. Well, Mark, now you are officially a published author. So to you, what's the most rewarding aspect of that? I really believe that I have something to share. And so the exciting part of just being able to recognize here's something that I've accomplished and be able to present it and give a tool to somebody that may need the hope and the reassurance that they're not some, you know, failure or, their, you know, their crisis in their life is not the end. But to be able to hand them something that says, you know, read this and maybe you can find some steps that will help you to overcome that trauma or that circumstance that gives you that sense of being a broken an individual. I really wanted to get something that offered hope, and I think I have something there to be able to share. I think readers are really going to be encouraged and empowered by this book. Again, it's titled Coin of Brokenness. Which side of brokenness are you? It's written by Mark E. Foltz, 
and published by Christian Faith Publishing, so go to Amazon or go to Barnes & Noble or go to iTunes or down the street to your local bookshop and you'll be able to pick this one up. Mark, thanks again for joining me and telling me all about this book. I had a really nice time talking with you tonight. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And there's lots of just nuggets there, and I hope it'll be a help and encouragement to many people. Author M.J. Candland has written a truly uplifting story in the new book, Second Chances. M.J. is sitting with me now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. We're going to talk all about it. MJ, welcome. I appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'm curious about Second Chances, MJ. Can you tell me what readers can expect? Yes, it's a Christian romantic comedy about the importance of faith, family, and forgiveness. What kind of reading audience do you think would be really into this? Adult women mostly, but really it's for anybody struggling with something difficult. There's something in it for everyone, even a little bit of action. Can you tell me how you got the idea, what inspired this book? I mean, I guess it just fell in my lap from heaven because the idea originally came to me 25 years ago. That was when it originally spawned. And then since then, it's grown in breadth and depth, and the characters have become my friends, which makes me sound like a little Looney Tunes quirky person. But, <laughs> you know, that's okay. <laughs> so how long of a process was this for you, including the writing, the publishing, the whole thing? Was, did that take a long time? Yes, it took an unusually long amount of time. I've been writing stories since I was in fourth grade. When I wrote, illustrated, and published my own story, complete with little stick figure drawings and a stack of paper folded in half hamburger way and stapled on the spine, you know, very fancy. Mm. And then by the time I was in seventh grade, 90% of my free time was spent filling spiral notebooks with stories. I was so shy and insecure, though, that I never really shared my stories with anyone but my, a couple of my best friends. And then a trusted adult once convinced me to let her read it, and she made fun of it. So that just kind of put a wedge in that, and I didn't want to ever bear my soul again. You creatives will understand that our work is a chunk of our soul. When I went off to college and adult life got busy, writing was really pushed to the back burner. Occasionally, I'd pull it forward, give it a stir, and add a few spices. But for the most part, being a mom and a wife were my priorities. When my late husband was unexpectedly diagnosed with terminal cancer, I realized how much I wanted to finish my book for him. He'd always been so supportive to me and my dream. But when I sat down to write, I realized that I was the star of a modern-day parable of the talents because I had hidden my talent under a bushel so long that it was being taken from me. I couldn't muster a creative, coherent sentence, let alone finish my novel. So I prayed and I prayed that Heavenly Father would give me a second chance. If he would please give me my talent back, I'd dedicate my writing to him. I'd create relatable, inspiring stories. So his children would know that they're not alone in their trials, you know. I promise that I would show them that they can do anything with the Lord on their side. And even the darkest of times can be filled with light if they seek him. And here we are. You got to tell me about that moment whenever you got your first copy of Second Chances in. You got to hold your book that you've been working on for so long. Names on the cover and everything. MJ, what was that like? Oh, my gosh, that was so surreal. I, <laughs> My heart was thundering in my chest and my hands were trembling. And, of course, I cried like a blubbery little lady. And <laughs> I was just so overcome with the whole gamut of emotions. You know, I turned the book over and over in my hands. And, of course, I smelled it because I <laughs> love the smell of new books. Oh, yeah. It was incredible. Well, now that you are officially a published author, MJ, what would you say is the most rewarding aspect of that for you? I would say that learning the importance of perseverance and, you know, I didn't give up and I was able to accomplish it with the Lord's help. And it's just been a really powerful experience that we can do hard things as long as we keep the Lord on our team. And yeah, the next chapter of our lives is really up to Him and He'll help us write that out. And I'm sure you've learned a lot along the way of publishing this. So MJ, do you have any advice now that you could throw out there to the authors who are just about to do that same thing? Yes, absolutely. Do not give up on your dreams. There is opposition in all things, especially the things we are called to do. And I would say that the process didn't go as smoothly as I dreamed it would. But keep your head up and keep going because it is totally worth it. I think a lot of readers are going to find this book such a blessing, and I encourage those listening to go seek it out. Again, it's titled Second Chances. It's written by M.J. Candland. 
and published by Covenant Books. So go everywhere that you usually pick up your books and you'll find this, like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. MJ, it was really nice talking with you tonight and learning about everything that was behind Second Chances. I hope we get to talk again sometime. Awesome. Thank you so much. Dr. Frank A. Lucas has just released a new book. It's a thoughtful reflection of key questions discovered along life's path. It's titled, Life is Linear, Living is Cyclical. And we're going to talk all about this. Frank is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Frank, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's good to talk to you. It's really good to be talking with you. I'm really curious about life as linear, living as cyclical. Can you tell me all about it? I'll tell you, it took me two years to write that book. And the inspiration came at Christmas dinner a couple of years ago with my grandchildren. You know how Christmas dinners go. And so we, they were asking questions and my answers were pretty binary. And they go, well, you're pretty one way, aren't you? And I <laughs> said, how many ways are there? What they were insinuating is that life is full of gray areas. And the fact is, things either turn out as you expect them or they turn out unexpectedly. And that's going to hold true through your whole life. It doesn't matter whether it's your health. It doesn't matter whether it's your marriage. It doesn't matter whether it's your friends. It just doesn't matter. The choices you make will either end up like you expect. It's, there's a wonderful quote that I just love, and, and it was Charles Swindell. And the quote is, life is 10% what happens to you, 10% of what happens to you, 90% of it is how you react. Based on that, I wrote this book so that people can appreciate the confidence they can have in creation. Well, what kinds of readers did you have in mind for this? Who do you think would be really interested in this book? Well, anybody that's interested in getting control of their life would be interested in it. But I wrote it for my teenage and early, oh, my grandchildren range from 26 to 18. Frank, what was it like when you got that first copy in, you finally got to hold it in your hands? It was wonderful. And it came just in time for me to give them to my grandchildren, signed mm. and autographed for <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. The publishing end of things can surprise a lot of people who are doing it for the first time. There's a lot involved there. Frank, what did you find the most challenging part of that? Picking out a publisher. That's so risky. One of my other books is called Creating Radiant Health, and I had it got misassigned to a publisher, and it never did blossom. And So I was really careful in selecting a publisher. My publisher is Christian Faith Publishing. I've been absolutely fortunate in what they've done. I'm looking forward to the maturation of this process. Frank, if you had one piece of really good advice that you could give to the aspiring authors who are listening, what would you give them? Be realistic. This stuff takes time. It's probably the slowest thing in maturation that I've ever done. People get used to the push button stuff. You push a button and it happens. And this stuff doesn't happen that way. It just takes time and it takes organization and it takes commitment on your part to be patient as you go through this process of creating something. The spoken word is ephemeral, the written word is permanent. So if what you have is in your estimation permanent, then in fact, you need to get it in the written word and finding the person to help you do that. I will tell you, it's a more complex than you might be led to believe. So be patient. <laughs> <laughs> do you think you'll be writing another book? Do you have plans for more writing in the future? I already am. This book before this one was called Creating Radiant Health, and it was the owner's manual for the care and maintenance of your body. The book we're talking about today is the book that says how you function in the world that is 90% locked in and 10% is all you got to deal with. And if you manage that, then you got to whip. The next one is called Lifestyle Mapping Made Simple. I think a lot of readers are going to love this. It, again, the title is Life is Linear, Living is Cyclical. This is written by Dr. Frank A. Lucas, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. So pick it up at Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. 
Frank, thanks again for coming on the show and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you. Well, thank you. I hope I didn't blab too long. It's an exciting book, and I love to brag on it. Author Lady Alice shows her heart for disabled children worldwide with her new audiobook titled Orchid. We're going to find out more about this. The author, Lady Alice, is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Lady Alice, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. The pleasure's all mine. I'm really interested in learning about Orchid. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, this book is from the heart. It is about a topic that is very dear to me. I have been going through just everyday life being disabled and not being sure where to be placed. So I wrote this book based off how society views us and my experiences on both ends of the spectrum. Hmm. Did you have a target readership in mind when you wrote this? Yes, it's for younger audiences, for if you have children who are disabled and also who have adults who are disabled that can't get help. So it's like all around type of book, but it is generated for the people who are like in their 30s and 40s, mostly. Well, once you started on Orchid, how long did it take you clear up through when it got published? It took me about a year and a half to figure everything out, put it on paper, then rewrite it, and then also then put it to the publisher and get that started. So it took some time, but it was a lot faster than I thought because I already had the idea. Uh, Before this one, have you ever written or been published before? No, that was my first work. I do have a second book out already that's called Lady Fall. And I also have pitched a third one that I just finished uh, about two days ago called Lady Spring Unchained. So a lot of new authors might be a little surprised by how much is involved in the publishing process. Yeah. Lady Alice, what was the most challenging part of the publishing end for you? For me, since it is basically because it's published by yourself, just basically getting the money together rather than having the actual work done. Because the work is easy. Once you already have it and you pitch it, that's basically it. But it's the money and making sure to maintain that money so you don't have to keep stopping and starting. Now, when that day finally came and you open your mailbox and there it is, the first copy of Orchid, and you got to hold it, look at it. I mean, your name's on the cover and everything. What was that like for you? It was a very surreal moment because I had this idea for so long. It's my passion. It's my life. It's my dream to actually be able to extend a hand to those who are feeling lost and out of place and all that. It really meant a lot to me. And I cried because it was I never knew that I was actually going to be able to get this work out there as I did. And this was all by myself. So from start to finish, it was basically my baby, my project. And now that you are a published author, what's the most rewarding aspect of that for you? That I can talk about it and that it's an actual step towards my future of trying to extend more of my other projects still underneath the baseline of being disabled because youth who are disabled have a hard time of being forgotten. You know, there are certain aspects of it where there's just so much that people are missing or not understanding. And so I just want to basically help out with that. Now, do you have any advice that you could offer to the aspiring authors who are listening? If you read it, you can kind of get a general sense of where I'm going and where I'm coming from. But there are also places that will be able to help. I'm not sure if that's what they're actually going to be looking for. But I can honestly tell you that there are ample places on actually how to help those who are looking for it, you know, basically. Mm. There are things like Regional Center, there's DCRC, which is in Culver, or Venice located, that also helps with disabled people. There is the VA, who, if you are a vet and you're disabled, that can also help as well. Hmm. Well, what a wonderful book this is. I think readers and audiobook listeners are really going to love it. Again, the title is Orchid. It's written by Lady Alice and published by the Audiobook Network. So head to Audible or iTunes or Amazon, any place really that you pick up your audiobooks, and you'll be able to find this. Lady Alice, I just wanted to thank you for coming on the show and chatting with me here tonight. It was really wonderful. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. 
We're going to talk about a book right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable that's an empowering message of the need to be aware of your spiritual path. It's titled The Upward Path. It's written by Dave DeBlander, and we're going to talk all about it. Dave is sitting here with me now. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm, I'm curious about The Upward Path, Part 1. Can you tell me what readers will find here? Yes. It was written for my grandchildren, Braden and Maddie, so that they could see the importance of God in my life. And then I hope that they pass it down to their children and their children and their children. I think everybody should write a book in that regard because, boy, wouldn't you love to have a book by your great, 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 great grandfather oh, yeah. and seeing what was important in his life and especially the aspect of how God dramatically changed and led his life. So that was the reason I originally wrote it. And then it just kind of grew from there. And people said, oh, you should write this book. Let everybody see it. So that's how it got started. Hmm. Now, did you write this for children? No, this is an adult book. I started out what form that I was going to do this in. I, I started out with a thousand quotes that I'd collected. I, you could call this a commonplace book. My grandchildren go to a classical school and commonplace books were in the vogue 100, 200 years ago. And basically it's a collection of things that you've seen and heard and you write them down. So that's what this is, a thousand quotes that I've collected and then certain stories that were impactful, that meant something to me. So it's 33 chapters. So it's every third chapter the first chapter will be an observation. Maybe it's a story from Oswald Chambers, Charles Spurgeon. Then the next chapter will be quotes, perhaps on victorious living, fear of God, fear, things like that. And then the third chapter will be a vignette from my life. And every one of those stories ends with the lessons that I learned. It goes all the way from my wife and I were hippies. We met in a commune. We lived with the Indians in South Dakota after the Wounded Knee Insurrection in 1974. I used to, I went to school in West Berlin, Germany, lived right next to the wall. I was an all-state basketball player in high school and various stories in my life. And some when I was quite lost and others when the Lord was leading me. And obviously there's a story in there on my salvation, how God saved me and how that came about. So that's what puts the book together. How long of a journey was this for you from the time you started writing it up until it was published? Six years. I could only imagine when that day came and you finally got your first copy, the physical one of this. And that must have been quite a day for you. What was that like? It was exciting. I guess I was immersed in working on it for so long. And I had so many different rough drafts and so many different titles that finally putting it together and getting it was more so of a moment of relaxation maybe than exhilaration. Finally, it's done because I had a number of people reading it. And so you need to put this in or that in. So that's kind of how that came to its conclusion. There's a lot involved in the publishing end of things. What did you find the most challenging part of that for you? Getting it so it would be readable. And like I got Adrian Rogers' book on his quotes, which is fantastic. And there's so many great quotes in there, but it was just, it, it didn't flow. There's, I mean, you could only have so many quotes impact you. So, and that, that was the first draft of my book was just quotes, a thousand quotes. And I did pare it down to 225 in the book, which was very difficult because I think all 1,000 were amazing. And about 600 of those are from my pastor and their stories in there. So it's kind of my book and his book definitely okayed me writing it. But even my title for the book, The Upward Path, came from me sitting next to him when one of the men in our church said, I don't trust God enough. And his answer to that led to the upward path. Well, I think a lot of readers are definitely going to be blessed by this book. Again, it's called The Upward Path. It's written by Dave DeBlander and is published by Christian Faith Publishing. So, of course, you can find it everywhere like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Dave, it's been so nice talking with you tonight and learning about The Upward Path. I hope we get to talk again. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the time. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, 
and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.